right, so we're back on the GT6. So welcome to another episode, guys. We're getting closer to starting the engine soon, but we're still not too close to that, right? We still have to install lots of many other things on the engine, including the distributor, which needs to be assembled. I took it apart to clean it and painted it. So still needs to be assembled the water pump, the oil filter, and what else here? And the fuel pump, of course. But before we start installing everything on the engine, we should take care of it, right? Just like we took the distributor apart and we cleaned it, we're gonna take apart the fuel pump as well, and we're gonna rebuild it. And she's already on my bench, actually. There's a beautiful example of an earlier GT6, so this is a customer in one of my previous videos. Some people were interested in this car. Well, it's not mine, unfortunately. <laughs> she was here just for a little bit of a tuning up and spring maintenance. So she's done. Soon she's gonna be picked up. But uh, here we have the fuel pump, which I wanna take care of first. So without further ado, let's get crackalocking. All right, so this is the fuel pump that came with the engine, with the car. And I don't know the condition, but I'd rather take it apart now and clean it. And I'm pretty sure the diaphragm is dried out. It's been sitting for 35 years, right? So uh, we have a rebuilding kit here from Most Motors 378530. And I just wanna make sure that we have everything that we need. So we have the two valves, we have gaskets, and we have the diaphragm, we have the little figure eight gasket, and I think that's everything. So let's take her apart. First of all, we're gonna take out this spring, which is awkward. I keep forgetting how, how to assemble it later, but now I'm gonna disassemble it in front of the camera. So hopefully, I'm going to be able to assemble it the same way. Looks simple, but when the time comes to assemble it, it's like, what the heck, how was this going? So that's how it goes. This cup we're going to have to clean and probably paint. There was an extra gasket here. Wow, two extra gaskets, so one underneath, one on the top. So it looks like she was leaking. This gasket is plastic. <laughs> Look at that. Yep. Already happy about the decision to take her apart, right? <laughs> That's how it needs to be. This is the, the screen. Sand. <laughs> there was sand in it. This is where the two valves live, and this is the diaphragm. It doesn't look cracked or anything, and it's still pliable, I think, but it is a critical part because if the diaphragm goes bad, fuel from above the diaphragm goes through, and then it goes into your oil, dilutes it, and then your engine starts crackalacking. <laughs> um, so how the diaphragm goes, it has this end here with the two notches that goes in. You have to push it down, slide it into a slot, and then turn it 90 degrees. So now we have to do the opposite. We have to push it down, figure out where the slots line up with the lever, with this lever, and this lever, and turn it 90 degrees so we can take it out. Come on, there you go. And we have a spring inside. I don't think we're gonna go further than that. We don't need to take it apart. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on the wire wheel 
and I'm going to try to clean everything as much as I can before we start assembling it back. Okay, so everything is cleaned up. Cleaned up the hardware, the springs, and the two parts of the body. I cleaned them as much as I could. All right, so next we have to replace the two valves. These are check valves, they only go one way. So when we have the cover, this top is sealed, right? So when the diaphragm goes down, it creates vacuum underneath, and this valve opens because it only comes this way, so when it opens, fuel comes in. But as soon as the diaphragm is all the way down, and it doesn't suck anymore, now the valve closes, and now the diaphragm goes up, and it creates pressure, so that pressure opens this valve, and now through this valve the fuel comes out and goes this way. So that's what the diaphragm does, it constantly creates vacuum and then it creates pressure, vacuum, pressure, it goes in and out. It's like, it's a pump. So we have to be careful in which orientation we put the two valves. They are pressed in and then the sides here are punched to create little blockage and that's what holds the valve inside. So now the only way to take this out is either we have to force it or we can actually grind a little bit around with the Dremel tool. I don't have a tool like this that's cylindrical, you know, it, this is like a bowl and I'm not sure it's gonna work. Maybe I can try. For this one maybe I can use this but for this one, I can't, obviously. Or I can force it out and then grind it with this. Well, let me try with this first. No, I think this is digging way too much. So, so actually, I'm gonna start with the other valve first. Let's see if this is gonna work well with the other valve. And if it works well, then we're gonna literally destroy this one and then grind the body. Trying to do it so you can see as well. Okay. Perfect. We broke it. So here you go. So here we have a gasket which is well, it's in a pretty good shape. And if you see, we have a gasket that's like figure eight, but these two are not connected here. So we can cut it, of course. Eh, we will see. So let's see if we can force the other one out. So this is the one that goes down. This is the one, like, I'm gonna mark it before I lose it. I'm just gonna put a dot there. This is the one that goes down. There you go, it came out. Well, this gasket is not in the best shape though. Yeah, I can feel these here. So I'm gonna clean them up quickly with the Dremel. Okay, perfect. We don't want to go too far. So let me clean this up a little bit. Okay. Okay, so here are our new valves. That's how they go. This is the one for here, right? 
So I'm going to take a socket. This happens to be 13 millimeter socket that fits barely inside. So I'm going to have to force them down gently. Until, until they bottom out. This one is the other side. Okay, this won't work now. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay, I need to figure out something else for here because I forgot about this part. Okay, so I found this old flywheel bushing that doesn't fit there nor fits around this, <laughs> but I went on the lathe and I turned it inside and outside. So now it fits around the valve and it fits inside there too. So now we can install it. And they go pretty hard there, but just in case, we're gonna punch some centers here with the center punch. Yeah, it would be great if I can put it on a hard surface, but I don't wanna damage the other side, so that's how we're gonna do it. Not where the old ones are, but around them. Oops. That went really well, actually, I think. Oh, that's perfect. I'll show you a closer view after. Okay, I don't know if you can see the little indents that the center punch made, but that's more than enough. Okay, so this part is ready, and this part is ready. Now, unfortunately, here there is a seal that doesn't come in the kit. This seal is for around the shaft here, so it prevents oil from coming this way and coming in this chamber. It's not a big deal if it goes there because there's no fuel here or anything. There's no vacuum on this side. Everything that's happening is above the diaphragm. Under the diaphragm, there's nothing. The thing is though, if your diaphragm goes bad, the fuel is supposed to leak through these holes. I don't know if you see here, but you have one, two, three, four holes. So in case your diaphragm starts leaking. You see how this is raised here. Even if this fills up with fuel, it should start coming out through these holes and not go into the oil. So there shouldn't be fuel there, but oil can come up this way. Every time I, I do this job, I tell this story. Once upon a time, I was driving a 1976 Renault 5 in Bulgaria. And at some point there was a little hole on the fuel pump right here. And as I was driving, it started smelling like fuel. So I opened the bonnet and what do I see? I see fuel squirting out through this hole. So I just turned off the engine, took some sealant and I plugged the hole. Problem solved. Didn't leak fuel anymore. I kept driving and a few days later, the engine started cranking as if there was no pistons inside. Well, that's what happened. My diaphragm went bad. That hole was, first of all, it was allowing the fuel to come out instead of going into the oil. And second, it was there to tell me, hey, you have to change the diaphragm. Well, I was 20 years old. I didn't know anything about those things. I just plugged it and I ruined my perfect engine. Anyways, later I rebuilt that engine, but again, that's another story. Taking parts from another engine that I took apart, I took the best parts from the two, a piston from here, a piston from there, and... I just put it back together with the best parts that I found. I never measured anything and it ran for 30 minutes. Then it ceased forever. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna put the spring there. We're gonna put the diaphragm. And now we have to match somehow the hole like this and then turn it 90 degrees. Come on. I don't know if it matters where this stone goes. I, I don't think so. I'm going to try to put it there. Yeah. 
I think it doesn't matter. Like that's the motion that we are looking for. Okay. And now we can put this cover. Now, as far as I remember, that's how it goes with the output towards the front of the engine, right? So this now is going to be for our input. I'm not going to tighten it. I'm going to look for another pipe for here, but for now I don't have any. Maybe I'm going to go buy one. Uh, 5 sixteenths brake line works fantastic here. The fitting is the exact same. The only thing is this uh, sleeve. You need to buy the proper sleeve for here. So I'm just going to go buy a brake line. I'm going to cut the flaring off and I'm going to use even the fitting probably because I don't know if I have a line for here. Anyways, we will see. Um, let's put the spring now. Do we remember how it was going? Like that. Why do we have two gaskets here? I guess there are two different types of pumps. I guess we need this one. Okay, this one is smaller, I guess. So, anyways, that's how it goes. Now here, that's important. This screw has this fiber washer here that is also sealing, right? Because we need to be able to create vacuum inside. When the pump goes down, we need to have vacuum, otherwise it's not going to suck. So this is important. Uh oh That's a problem. That's a problem with this pump. Ha ha ha. So we need a longer screw because the threads, the threads are gone here. Dun, dun, dun. How long? Okay, look at that. How long can this screw be? Not too long. Oh. I'm gonna have to figure this out. Oh my god, the last process and we're screwed. Now we need to figure out this. Can we make a bigger screw? All right, if we have to, we can buy a new pump. It's like $24, something like this, but new pumps are not great. I always prefer to rebuild my old pump than buying a new one. So I have two ideas here. The second idea is to use a the next thread bolt, tap new threads there, but I don't want to drill a bigger hole here and I want to be able to use the same seal. So I'm thinking if we tap the next thread there, but then on the lathe we can turn this to the sl to smaller diameter and make threads like this size and then use a nut on the outside. It's going to be a step stud, but then we're going to have a nut on top and I don't like that. So my first idea <laughs> is this. I found this stainless, uh, found this stainless bolt and the nut. And this is, I believe, quarter inch, but it's coarse thread, so it still fits there. So I'm thinking I'm just gonna tighten it as far as it goes. I'm not even gonna tap threads. It's gonna tap its own thread, and then I'm gonna cut the head. I'm gonna put the cover on. I'm going to see how long it needs to be and then I'm going to shorten it to the right size and then I can use this uh, acorn nut here. That's what I came up with. And it's going to be nice and stainless on top, right? <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, it feels really nice and tight. 
not gonna over torque it. As soon as it stops, I will stop. I'm not gonna force it. It went far in already, so I'm happy. But the deeper it goes, the better. Okay. Yeah, let's just cut the head. Okay, we have to put the gasket for measurement reasons. Okay, if we cut it somewhere here, we're gonna have enough threads, but we're gonna need, give it enough room also to, to tighten itself, right? So I hope we measured it right. <laughs> Love it. Hope it doesn't leak. Wow. There you go. <laughs> nice. Pump rebuilt. Now, should I paint the cover black? The cover was black before. We will see. If I don't like it on the engine... Eh. Well, actually, it doesn't look bad. Because the distributor also is silver, sitting there, so eh, it's not bad. Also, the filter underneath is kind of silver because it's uh, aluminum. So we'll see. It takes two minutes to disassemble it and paint it, so we will decide. All right, it's a few days later, and we've done a few external projects. <laughs> I should call them and uh, they're now gone so uh, we're back on our own rusty beauties so this baby we took her for her first car show this year she ran great it was about 110 kilometers away from here so she ran great on the way there and on the way back perfect no problem the only thing is i need to address the rattling under the timing cover because it's uh, becoming annoying it doesn't affect how she runs much i think but we definitely need to address it but anyways we are on this baby still right so so for you it's like a minute later but for me it's a few days later so we rebuilt the pump we still have to mount it permanently there and now let's take our distributor from here and assemble it oops Actually, I moved to a different table so I can put you across the table and hopefully you're gonna see better because I added, because I already edited the first part of this video with the fuel pump and it actually doesn't look great when you're watching from the side. Anyways, I hope this is gonna be better for you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just dump everything on the table. Let's see if I remember how to assemble it. Okay, so many parts and I don't remember anything. <laughs> so, so we're gonna start assembling it. But before we start, let's look at what's inside the distributor here, what we didn't take apart. So that is our mechanical advance. Uh, mechanical advance works with centrifugal forces. The faster the engine speed, the more the weights here open and that advances the timing. So if I hold the bottom here of the shaft and I put the rotor, you can see that actually the bottom of the shaft is not permanently connected to the top. The top of the shaft is actually connected to the weights and the weights as they open, I don't know, I, I can't demonstrate it here, but as they open, they offset the top of the shaft relative to the bottom a little bit forward means that we give the rotor a little bit of advance so very simple the higher the rpm the, the wider the weights open and the more advance we give to the rotor however so why do we need advance though well we don't have time to explain everything in this video plus i explained it recently in another video but it's related to the amount of time that the fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber burns it's always constant. It's about two milliseconds, one and a half to two milliseconds. Doesn't matter of the speed of the engine, always takes 
the same amount of time. And we want that mixture to be completely burnt to about 14 degrees after top dead center. Well, this means that at lower RPM, we need to ignite it a little bit later, maybe four degrees before top dead center. So at 14 degrees after top dead center is completely burnt, but at higher RPM, we need to start this process much earlier, maybe 20 or even 30 degrees before top dead center. So until the entire amount of the mixture inside it burns, we're gonna be already at 14 degrees after top dead center. So that's why we need advanced. Uh, somehow we need to ignite the fuel much earlier at higher RPM. So that's achieved with the mechanical advance. But why do we need a vacuum advance as well? Because the mechanical advance is related to the RPM of the engine, of course. Uh, what happens though, when we snap the throttle and we expect the car to go and increase the RPM, well, then because the throttle opens wide, and we have vacuum inside the manifold that sucks a lot more air all of the sudden and by the time this air drags more fuel through the jet inside the manifold and inside the cylinders initially we have a very lean mixture for milliseconds but we have a lean mixture for that period of time and lean mixture burns longer than rich mixture of course so that's why we need to give it a little bit more time as well. But the RPM is low and the mechanical advance is not doing anything yet. It's going to start advancing the timing a little bit later. So for that moment, for that initial moment, we have the vacuum advance, which this is a retard, but we're going to talk about that later. So we have a vacuum advance, which uses vacuum from before the throttle butterfly or whatever you want to call it. That vacuum advance at idle is not operated. It shouldn't be operated because some people connect their vacuum advance to the manifold vacuum, which means that the unit is always, is always under load and it's always advancing. The, the ignition, which doesn't do much anyways. So the vacuum uh, advance needs to be connected to a ported vacuum, which means that at idle, there's no vacuum on that port. As soon as we open the throttle, that's when vacuum goes immediately to our vacuum advance unit and that advances the vacuum right away, which gives more time to the lean mixture to burn. So that's basically how it works. And all we want to do now here is make sure that the weights are moving freely. We're going to lubricate them and we're going to go from there. Now, we also have to make sure that the bushing on the shaft here inside is not damaged. So there's no play on the shaft. So we're ready to assemble. We're gonna come back to the vacuum retard because in this case, this is a retard, which is retarded. <laughs> we don't need it. But yeah, let's uh, lubricate this and then start assembling. I wish there was a way that I can spin this faster, but it's gonna come back to whatever. All right, so now here we have to assemble these two plates that also go like this. And this is, so the bottom is the base plate and the one on the top is the one that holds our points and uh, everything else that actually gets advanced whenever we want it to be advanced. So this is the plate that is getting turned by the vacuum advance. I keep calling it vacuum advance. This is retard, but the vacuum advance looks exactly the same, except it has port on this side, not on this side. So the vacuum advance is hooked up to the plate somewhere, I think here. And whenever we have vacuum, it pulls it like this. And whenever we don't have vacuum, it returns it back. So that's why we need this motion here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little bit of a lithium grease here as well. And that is how the plate goes. All right, so here, now we have to put, there's, um, there's this hole here through which now we have to put this little plastic pin. Then on the other side, we have this star washer, and then we have this spring, which needs to lock. The pin has a little bit of a notch here, which is for the spring to lock there.
see? I was thinking I have to trim my nails. Good thing I didn't. <laughs> and I'm gonna spray a little bit of a lithium grease here where the three plastic feet are because they have to be able to slide nicely. There you go. And now here underneath, we have to put these uh, mm, like sir clips. There's a notch. So the two plates don't get separated. I don't know why there are two, but there are. Make sure that it falls inside the notch. And that's it. This plate now is assembled. So now we can put it inside. And there's these two holes here that are close to each other. And that's where these two little tabs should go. Now this is where the vacuum retard goes now. It goes like this and it hooks up to this hole in the plate. So this screw also holds that, okay. So like I said, in this case, we don't have a vacuum advance, which is weird because I've seen units that have vacuum advance and retard. In this case, we only have vacuum retard, which I don't think we're gonna use, but we're gonna put it there because it's there. And I will see if I can get uh, for this distributor, a unit that is a vacuum advance actually that we can use because vacuum retard is only for emissions reasons. I have no idea exactly how it works. It retards the timing at idle. I guess it's better for the environment. I don't know, but I'm not going to hook it up. I'm just going to put it there, but I'm not going to hook it up. But this is how it works. When I pump it up, you see, it turns the plate counterclockwise, which retards it. If it goes clockwise, it is advanced. If it goes counterclockwise, it's retarded. If we, it's opposite to the rotor, of course, because the rotor, when it goes more counterclockwise, that's when it's advanced. And when it goes clockwise, that's when it's less advanced or retarded. This rotor actually has a lot of play. So we're gonna buy a new one and we're gonna replace it. But anyways, we're gonna get rid of, uh, we're not gonna use the uh, vacuum retard. Here, I think it's better if we go on the vise. And I wanna show you, we're not gonna assemble it with the points, but actually I wanna show you how the points go, just so you know. So you know what, let's go on the vise. Well, this is why I hate my wireless microphone. Well, I love it because it cancels all the annoying sounds from around me. And also when I'm away from the camera, I don't need to yell. But when the battery goes dead, it just goes dead. And I have absolutely no idea that what I'm recording has no audio. So the rest of the assembling I filmed without an audio. And I'm going to show you here a little bit with a voiceover, but I really don't like that. So I'm going to cut it short. Uh, so basically what happened was I just discovered here that now the shaft cannot spin because the weights underneath are hitting that plastic pin that I put upside down. <laughs> so I had to disassemble everything again and flip the pin the right way up. And then uh, the shaft started spinning properly. The vacuum retard still worked. I tested it even though I'm not going to hook it up, but of course I want it to be assembled properly. And then there was another problem. The other problem was that the electronic ignition that I bought is for a different distributor. I assumed that since the GT6 and the TR6 blocks are the same, the distributors would be the same. But as it turns out, the GT6 distributor is different. So the mounting plate for the electronic ignition needs to be different. And it looks like also the shaft with the cams is a little bit smaller diameter, even though it's not around. It's a hex, but okay, the, the size is smaller than the TR6. So the magnetic ring, which is part of the electronic ignition, 
doesn't fit very well, it wobbles. So I could make it work, I could modify a little bit the mounting plate, I could jam the ring somehow on the shaft, but I don't want to do it the Bulgarian way, you know. <laughs> so I decided to assemble the distributor with the points again, with the old points, but um, they don't look very well, as you can see here, they don't close properly. And I dragged a little bit of file there, but I'm not really happy, so I ordered new ones. And since we're going to be installing new points in the distributor, that's when I'm going to show you how to install points. So there's no point of showing the process here, going through voiceover and stuff like that. So, so I think we're going to cut the video here and uh, we're going to show the rest of the assembling in the next one. So even my outro I recorded without audio, so, <laughs> so the video and the audio here are not going to be in sync, but you know my usual rumbling at the end of the day. But what's important from what I said here was that I'm really grateful guys for your continuous support and I thank you so much for everything that you do for me through Patreon, PayPal and even sending me stuff all the time. Uh, so once again guys, thanks for watching, thanks for commenting, subscribing, sharing and supporting me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!